All right, everybody, we're going to turn our attention here to Sjogren's Syndrome, and you probably have some idea of what this is because it's a fairly unique disorder. Um, it does get tested quite a bit on step two and step three, so you'll want to know how to work this up uh, and how to treat this um, because, number one, it is fairly common, especially among patients who already have rheumatologic disorders, okay? Okay. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel and you will get updates and notifications every time I put a new video up, which I try to do fairly frequently. All right, Sjogren's syndrome is an autoimmune disorder that targets the exocrine glands. So we're talking here primarily salivary, lacrimal, and parotid glands. Salivary glands, if those get attacked, dry mouth, xerostomia. Uh, lacrimal glands, if those get attacked, dry eyes, xerophthalmia. And then the parotid glands, they more so just get enlarged when they're affected. Now the prevalence is around 1 to 2% or so. There's a 10 to 1 female predominance, so uh, expect if you get a case like this on your exam, it's going to be a woman. Uh, onset is usually in adulthood, 30s, 40s or so. The complications, which we'll go into, are primarily malignancy, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, like a malt lymphoma, uh, neonatal lupus, and that's due to the fact that there is a strong coincidence here with the anti-Rho antibody. And remember that that can cause neonatal lupus. So if these patients are pregnant, um, we need to be very careful. This is parotitis. So it's fairly obvious here. Um, what you see is the swelling, and sometimes it's on one side, you, more commonly it's on both, um, but what you're seeing here is an inflammation, and that's causing, you know, that edema that we typically see in inflammation, um, and so it causes the enlargement of the parotid gland. The parotid gland is a very big gland, so when it gets inflamed, um, it's very easy to see. Here's, you can see another case. Now, when you have dry mouth over a long period of time, the tongue can dry out, and you get this hyperlobulated tongue, so keep an eye out for that. All right, so um, as far as your history, look for other autoimmune syndromes. So remember I said it's like 1% or 2% of the population has Sjogren syndrome? Well, if you have lupus, about 1 in 5 will have Sjogren syndrome, and about 1 in 3 people with RA will have Sjogren syndrome. So you can imagine that 2% a lot of them have RA or lupus. So look for that in the history. Symptoms we already talked about, however, they can have extraglandular manifestations. So things like arthralgia, Raynaud, myalgias. Um, so in that case, you know, we may be thinking things like lupus or things like RA. So we're gonna need to consider that as part of our workup if they don't already have a diagnosis. Uh, this is a criteria-based diagnosis, but what I want to turn your attention to is that biopsy of the salivary gland plays a role here too. And that indeed is the most accurate test. Now, we don't actually need to go to the main gland to, uh, to biopsy. We can, out, we can actually just go to the lip. We can do a lip biopsy. There's glands there, and those glands will be infiltrated in Sjogren's. And so that's a much easier uh, way to go about this, much safer way to go about this. That said... Nobody likes to have their lip cut into, do they? This is uh, the 2016 criteria. So notice that the labial salivary gland biopsy is plays a big role. It's worth three points if it's positive. Uh, the anti-rho, uh, which is going to be part of our initial workup, that's another big one. And then there's these other tests that you can do in the clinic. So our workup is going to be rheumatoid factor. That's not typically positive in Sjogren syndrome, but it can be, and it can also be a sign of other autoimmune disorders. So we want to include that because remember, if you have one, you are very likely to have another. Uh, you want to get ANA, anti-Rho, and anti-Law. Those are more specific. Anti-Rho and anti-Law are more specific for Sjogren's. Get a SED rate, and then we have this thing called the Schirmer test. I'll show you in the next slide, and then a CBC and BMP. So the Schirmer test, basically what we do is we take a little pH strip and we insert it uh, underneath the lower eyelid and we let the tears flow. You don't need to make them cry. It'll be a normal response to having something stuck in your eye. And the strip will turn color uh, as the tears flow. 
And what we expect to see is at least 10 millimeters of color change. So that's basically telling you how much tears you're making. If there's less than five millimeters over five minutes, that's a positive result. And so we would consider that a positive Schirmer test. And that would be one of our criteria, good for one point. And it's, if there's, I should say, greater than or equal to four, um, that is a diagnosis. So if you just have the anti-rho and you've got the positive Schirmer test, you got a diagnosis. So you don't always need to do the biopsy. All right, so this is what we would expect to see in Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, the anti-rho and anti-law are uh, fairly sensitive. Anti-law a little less so. Some people won't even test anti-law, uh, but I would get both of them uh, because if they're both positive, that is very highly suggestive of Sjogren's syndrome. Now the lip biopsy, I would hold off on until you, uh, un until you do your general labs, because if you can diagnose with an anti rho and a Schirmer test and you don't need to do the lip biopsy, then great, you don't need to do it. Um, but let's say their Schirmer test was negative and the anti rho was positive or vice versa, and you're not up to those four points, then you should get the lip biopsy. Don't memorize that point system. Just have a good idea that if you've got a picture, a lab picture that looks like Sjogren's syndrome, um, you may not need to do the biopsy. Treatment is symptom-based. This is why it's not super, super important to get that lip biopsy because we're not really doing anything here that's going to harm them anyway. So for dry eyes, we'll do artificial tears. For dry mouth, we do artificial saliva. Um, there are other things, sour candies, gum and stuff they say might help stimulate the uh, saliva uh, release. Patient education, use a humidifier, uh, use moisturizer. If this is a woman, uh, because vaginal, uh, the vagina has glands that can be uh, impacted, they can develop uh, vaginal dryness, itching, dyspareunia, um, then there are vaginal lubricants that, that can be used too. Estrogen would not help with that. Uh, extra glandular manifestations are actually treated like lupus. So that here what I'm talking about is if there's any kind of rash, but usually it's going to be myalgias and arthralgias, we would treat that like lupus. So hydroxychloroquine and NSAIDs would be our treatment. That's what we do for lupus. Prognosis is pretty good. The big problem is heme malignancies, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, malt lymphoma in particular. 80 times relative risk. So it's not a super common uh, cancer, but it is fairly common in Sjogren's, at least much more common. So this is our management here. All right, so to recap, it's an autoimmune disorder that targets exocrine glands, uh, presents as dry eyes, dry mouth, and a history of dental caries, especially in a patient who's got an established rheumatologic disorder. Very strong correlation with things like lupus and RA. Workup should include ANA, anti-rho, and anti-law. Uh, however, the most accurate test is a lip biopsy. Whether you need to do it is up to your clinical judgment how much evidence you have for Sjogren's syndrome. The treatment is symptomatic, tear and saliva replacement, moisturizers and humidifiers. Uh, local immunosuppressants are second line, so don't go to those first. Extra glandular involvement is treated like lupus. That would be hydroxychloroquine and NSAIDs.